You know, uh, a few months ago, Steve asked me if I would share on uh, a couple Sundays while he was gone. And uh, he said he's going to be going through 1 Corinthians. And I said, sure, I would love to, no problem. Uh, what chapters would you like me to go over? And I'm thinking, you know, chapter 13, that'd be awesome. You know, the love chapter. And of course, I get chapters 5 and 6. And I'm like, why did I ever say yes? You know, um, when you look at these chapters, I think Bruce and I were talking about it after first service, and they're just dark. They are, it's like, who wants to talk about this? Who likes confrontation? Who likes it? <laughs> One person. Pray for his wife. Um, but seriously, none of us like to be confronted on our error, and none of us like to confront somebody else on their error. Um, hopefully, and especially when it's, we're hurt, right? Especially when it's very uncomfortable and it's very obvious, we rather ignore it and act like it's not there. Uh, we rather just kind of bury it and forget about it or put it way back in the closet and just never go in that area of our lives again and do our best not to let it affect us too much. But see, the Apostle Paul in no way will do that. The Apostle Paul is going to confront these things. And I want you to keep in mind something, you guys, about what's going on in the Corinthian church. Um, they are divided, remember? They're on different gangs. You know, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Jesus. And they're all picking sides and, and um, really dividing the body of Christ there. They're spiritually immature, where the Apostle Paul goes as far as to say, you know, you guys, you can't even handle me. You guys are just always drinking milk. That's all you want. You have not grown at all. Very immature. They're abusing the Lord's table. They're abusing the gifts. And worst of all, they're abusing each other. And the thing you have to ask yourselves is what is at the foundation? What's the root of all these problems? What is the root of their actions towards each other? What is the root of them being divided? Why are they so immature? Why are they not growing? And one man said this, the problem behind the problems in Corinth is their arrogance. Is their arrogance. They know it all. They're, they're beyond the teaching of Christ. I don't have to apply love my neighbor as myself anymore. I don't have to do any of those things. But see, the thing about it is the Apostle Paul sends this letter to them. He had, in Acts 18, he had founded the church. He knew these people intimately intimately. He knew them by name. They just were not faces in a crowd. These are people that he shared his life with. He shared the gospel with. He shared the Lord's table with. All these things are the dearest, most intimate elements of the Apostle Paul's life. And now he's watching them, and he's looking at them, and, and like the church is just falling apart. They're not living the way they should. The song Carolyn is saying to us this morning, I live as I'm forgiven, as if I'm forgiven. Think about that. That means I, I admit that I've done something wrong and I accept the grace that God gives me. And I live in the reality and the beauty in the wonder of his mercy and his grace towards me to the point where everybody that I look at is better than me. Worthy of my love, worthy of mercy, worthy of grace, worthy of my patience. And we think about these things. And the thing I want you to understand, too, is that the Apostle Paul, he's writing not as being superior or as being self-righteous or as being perfect, but he's writing from, as a, from a father's heart. And, you know, um, having kids uh, radically has changed me. Having a daughter, uh, and if you've met Mary, then you know two things. One, you need to pray for me a lot, right? Uh, and two, man, this girl is full of spunk, and she's full of her opinions, and she doesn't back down. Like, I used to be able to kind of intimidate her because I'm dad. She'll call my bluff every time now. It's like, let's see your cards, dad. Yeah, I didn't think you had anything, you know? It, it's brutal. But the thing about it I want you to see is that when the apostle writes this strong, authoritative, disciplinary letter, he's doing it from a father's heart. And, you know, um, being a dad, my son has been sick now for about a month. He's had this fever. Um, they've done blood work on him. Uh, he, he still has a fever. It's been just terrible to watch. And I was talking to my good friend. Uh, my good friend had just lost his son a few months ago. And he said, you know, Armando, the one thing you are going to realize as a parent is that when your kids suffer, you hurt with them. And when they do wrong, you love them even more. 
when they continue to do wrong, all it does is expand your heart and your desire to embrace them and to bring them close. You don't want to push them away. You want to draw them near. And that's what we see the Apostle Paul doing. The church isn't like Philippi or Ephesus or these other churches or Colossians. that They're doing good, right? They're growing. No, this church is rebellious. He's like, you know, the, the middle child, the one that's never good enough or you can never connect with. It's that child. But Paul's going, I don't want to cast you away. I want to draw you near. I want to love you. I want you to be everything that God wants you to be. I want you to have the peace that Christ died to give you, and not just personal peace, but peace amongst each other. That's what he desires for them. And I think we cannot get past the desire of the apostle, that, and I think he captures it in Galatians 4.19 when he speaks to them in their struggle. He says this to them, My little children, for whom again I'm in anguish as of in childbirth, until Christ is formed in you. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to hand you over. I'm not going to ever leave you until Christ is formed in you. That's God's desire for each one of us. Our faith is not a faith of institution. It's just not. Our faith is not something we come and we join a social club and we go to it and it has a cross on it. Our faith is, is solely found in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we live as though he has forgiven us. We live as though he lives and dwells inside of us. We, beloved brethren, are the church. We, as the Apostle Peter would say, are the living stones of the body of Christ. Not the temple of Herod, not the temple of Solomon, not the tent of Moses. No, no, we're greater than that. The Holy Spirit dwells in each and every one of us. And in that reality now we live. Now there are two key verses that I want us to um, understand, to understand Corinthians better. And the first one is found in chapter 10, verse 31. And the apostle writes there, and we'll see it in weeks to come, but he says this, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So number one, Corinthian church. Your sole aim in life, whether you eat, whether you drink, no matter what you do, do all to the glory of God. Now keep that in mind. That's our aim. That our lives somehow, some way, would bring glory to Christ. Okay? Number one. Number two, he says this to them. In verse six, chapter 16, verse 14, he says, Everything you do should be done in love. So, okay, we're, we're talking here. We, we read the passage this morning. We're talking about a, a man in the church who's living in sin. Not just he fell into it or was tempted. No, he's living in sin having his father's wife, his stepmom. He's shacking up with her, right? And it's not just the church that knows. Everybody knows. Everybody knows. And it's a scandal. And the Apostle Paul goes, you know what? You guys, everybody knows it. And even those that aren't believers in Christ know this is wrong. It's like, it's not like it's questionable. It's not a gray area. It's very black and white. And you guys, instead of being grieved over it, and I I was thinking about this, you know, today or this week, what do you think this guy's dad felt? How do you think he felt? His wife is now shacking up with his son. I mean, he'd be devastated. He would have to be. And yet, what's the response of the church? Paul rebukes them for it. They are boasting in it. They're kind of proud, kind of laughing at it. Like, oh man, that kid, he's so crazy. Oh my, I can't, oh man, that guy, he has a lot of guts. And Paul's going, man, what is wrong with you? You should be tearing your clothes and repenting, mourning over what this man is doing. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? And so we see this, and I, want, I really think this to you guys. So how is Paul going to deal with this? He has two goals in mind. Number one, that how how the church deals with it gives glory to Christ. I really want you to see that. That how they confront this young man, how they deal with this person, has to bring glory to Christ, number one. Number two, they cannot go in anger. They cannot go in self-righteousness. They cannot go with rocks in their hands. They have to go do all, what did Paul say? In love. They're not trying to just punish the man. That's not the goal of this. 
They're trying to win him back. And that's what makes us different than the world. We don't want to ostracize the person. We want to, what, win them back to being all that God is calling them to be. And we have to see that. And I really believe this, that these two verses are just expressions of the great commandment. And what is the great commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Glory to God, love to the neighbor. I don't know about you guys, no one ever hurts me more than those that I love. Dad, my, my mom never really hurt me. She's, she's been a great lady. Dad, right? Friends, people in the church. You guys ever been backstabbed? Ow. You ever been backstabbed by a friend? Double ow, right? Do you ever have someone gossip about you and it wasn't even true? That's the worst. Where does that happen? In the church. We're talking about the Corinthian church here. They didn't have just any pastor. They had the apostle Paul. So don't be blaming the pastor. And I'm not the guy here anyways. You looked at somebody else for that one. Just kidding. Um, but, <laughs> but think about it. Think about it. How are they going to deal with this young man? <clears throat> I think if you look, if you open your Bibles again with me really quick, I like opening the Bible when I come to church. It makes me feel comforted. But in verse 6 and verse, verses 6, 7, 8, I think really summarize this chapter for us. They really capture what's going on and how Paul wants them to handle it and why he wants them to handle it this way. But notice what he says there in verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens a whole lump? Now, again, you guys, I want us to go back. Even though this boy is in terrible sin, the goal is to go to him in love and to reconcile the relationship, not just to them, but to Christ. I'm going to use Julio again as an example because he was there first service and Julio knows me. But if Julio and I, had, if, if we had hurt each other and he had hurt me and I was to go to Julio in anger and in vengeance, would my relationship to him be reconciled? I mean, it's pretty, pretty basic, right? There's no way. But if I went to Julio in vulnerability, being vulnerable, and who likes to do that? No one. But I'm opening myself up, and I'm going, hey, bro, Julio, man, I need to talk to you just privately one-on-one. -on -one. Hey, you know, when you said that the other day, you really hurt my feelings. And, man, I'm just really bummed. I mean, why, why did you do that? And he'd be like, Armando, whatever. I was wrong. Please forgive me. What happens? Bang. We're cool, man. Won't even bring it up again. We're good. But if Julio comes to me, because Victoria says to him, I think you hurt Armando's feelings. And he comes up to me and he goes, hey, Armando, uh, if I hurt your feelings, if there's a chance that maybe I bummed you out, uh, I'm sorry. I'd be like, why did you even bother, dude? Now I'm doubly insulted. Maybe if you hurt my feelings, you know you hurt my feelings. But that's how we handle things, right? We try to deflect them, diminish them, marginalize the hurt we cause other people, rather than just, man, just be truthful. Let's just do this and be honest. That's how Paul wants them to do this. But since this boy is unrepentant, Paul says what? A little leaven. What contaminates all of us. The thing about it is this. You are a member of the body of Christ. We are members of churches. We are members and how we speak and how we treat and how we act towards each other affects everyone. Have you noticed that? Words, complaints, gossip. It doesn't just like, no, it doesn't go unheard. We all hear it. We might not have been there at the conversation, but we all hear it. It affects all, a little leaven affects the whole lump. This boy's actions are not just between him and his dad and him and this woman. This guy's actions is affecting the very church of Corinth. And the thing about it is they have to act instead of ignore it. I mean, man, I hate confrontation. I hate it. I will pray that someone else does it. I will talk to my wife about talking to my daughter, right? Hey, babe, you really need to talk to Mary. And she's looking at me like, no, you need to talk to your daughter. She's yours too. No, only when she brings straight A's home, she's mine. But any problems that she might have, she's now yours, you know? But that's how we act. That's how we treat things. We try to deflect it. And this church in Corinth, these leaders were totally ignoring it. They were going to act like it's going away. It'd be like you coming up to me and saying, hey, Armando, you have just a little bit of skin cancer. 
just a little bit on your nose. Well, what should I do with it? Well, you should get it cut out. Oh, it's just a little bit of cancer. What's the worst that can happen? Right? Oh, it's just a little bit of a tumor. How far can it go? It can destroy the whole body. Right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. But we act like this, this young man's, they're acting like this young man's sin is not going to affect anybody. And Paul's going, you're going to lose your witness. You're going to lose your credibility. Most importantly, and the saddest part, you're going to lose your love for one another. If I do not discipline my children, the Bible tells me that I don't love them. If I let them run amok and do what they want, the Bible tells me you don't love your children. When we all did it, right? Hopefully we don't hit our children to punish our children in anger. We go, hey, buddy, this is what you did. I love you, but it's on. It's on, and I warned you, all right? But I love you. I love you so much. It hurts, and it does hurt to discipline you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It contaminates everything. So what does the Apostle Paul say? You're boasting, number one, it's not good. The way you're dealing with this, the way you're looking at this is all wrong, number one. Number two, don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Don't be ignorant. Don't act like it's not going to spread. Don't act like it's not going to affect anybody. It's going to affect everyone. What should we do, Paul? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. See, the thing about it is this. This is what I love about Paul. If you go back to chapter 1, he calls this immature, dysfunctional church the saints of Christ, sanctified in the Lord. He wants to remind them of who they are. I lived in Hungary for 10 years of my life. 10 years. All my 20s, I was in Hungary, <clears throat> into my early 30s. And, um, you know, I began to think I love Hungarian food. Thank God for that. I love their food. I love the country. But I never forgot that I was an American. I would go to the embassy. I'd walk by the embassy in Budapest, and I would see the old red, white, and blue. And I would get choked up, and I'd be like, I miss my home. This is where I'm living, but that is my home. And I was all super duper patriotic, right? Because I knew what it was to be away. I knew what it was to be away. And these believers in Corinth are forgetting who they are in Christ. They are forgetting that Christ has died for them. They are forgetting that since they have chosen to follow Christ and put their faith in him, that their conduct is going to change. The old way of doing things is now over. The old way of viewing oneself is now different. The old way of viewing each other is different. The way we treat each other is different. And they're forgetting that. So what is Paul saying? You're a new lump. You're a new lump. There, there is no leaven in you. But there is a little bit, so you need to get it out. Deal with it. Number one, in the corporate church, you need to deal with this young man. And here's the beauty of it. If you go to the second letter of Corinthians, they dealt with him. They said, bro, you can't come until you repent. You can't come to the Lord's table until you repent. And that must have done something in this young man's life. Because it says that he repents in the second They restored him in the second letter. So discipline then, we see right away, is not punitive. It's not to hurt somebody or humiliate somebody or bring them on the stage. And I know some churches that have done this to people and say, Armando has sinned and he should be kicked out. Right? That's how some churches do it. No. The goal of discipline is to restore that person to a right relationship with Jesus Christ and a right relationship to each other. And then we learn how we are now to live with each other, husband and wife, parent to child, child to parent. Because here's the thing about it, you guys. I don't know if you've noticed this. I know you'll be shocked by this, but we're all different. <laughs> do you notice that? Like you're, do you, I've noticed this about my wife. She doesn't like the things I like. She's converted a little bit. Like, I, I, I gave in on the Home Garden Network, and she gave in on me watching Dodger games, all right? So there was a little give, there was a little take, right? But man, if I had my choice, I would, I would just exclude that channel from my TV. I would never watch it again, right? But I got to give in once in a while. But we're different, so that means that we're going to have conflict. We're going to have different views of things. 
But the problem is this. Instead of trying to win the argument, why don't we try to understand the argument? Why don't we try to understand the other person? Remember what Paul says later on in Corinthians? Love is the answer, number one. Paul says, love hopes all things and love believes all things. What does that mean? When my, when my wife does something to irritate me or maybe, maybe by chance hurt my feelings, I say she didn't mean to do that. I say, I know she's tired. She just got home from work. I know she had a rough day at work. She's just, she snapped at me, but she didn't mean it. I believe and I hope that she loves me. I think the best of her. I think the best of her. Not the worst. And the problems we have in the church is, the moment I hear that Julio said something about me or did something, I go, oh man, he meant it. He's, oh, he's never liked me. He's always wanted to get me. He's always, it's like, someone would say, do you know who, that's not Julio. Oh, yes, it is. No, if you get to know him, he's really a cool guy. <laughs> well, not to me, he's not. Mm, yeah, even to you, believe it or not. But that's, we, we go, we think the worst of each other. We think the worst, and that leads to so much damage and hurt and pain. And we can't ignore it, you guys. You wouldn't ignore it in your marriage, would you? Would you ignore it? It's going to play out badly sooner or later. It's going to play out badly unless the leaders of the church and those that have been offended and those that have been hurt, let's come not in anger, but in love. Not in arrogance, but in humility. Not wanting to win the argument, but wanting to have peace. Then and only then, we'll be doing what God has called us to do. We'll be acting the way God has called us to act. This is what makes us different than the world. This. Loving each other, forgiving each other, thinking the best of each other. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is the old leaven characterized by? Malice and evil. Malice and evil. Man, you know, you get around certain people, and the older we get, that, that, whatever's been festering in our hearts, it just kind of comes out, doesn't it? Our, our, our anger, our frustration, our bitterness, our unforgiveness, our pride, our ego. If we are not dealing with these things in grace and in love and in forgiveness, they just start coming out. But then you get around somebody, as we saying, I live as if I'm forgiven, and I know that I'm forgiven. And I start there. My dad... My, God bless my dad. He had a rough childhood. My grandma used to just beat him. So I, I give my dad grace. But my dad used to cuss me out from top to bottom. I, and this is me. I would call him up. Hey, dad, how you doing? You no good. And he would just go off on me. Cuss me out. Every cuss word you could think of. And I would sit there and take it. And then he would hang up. Bam. And my mom would look at me. And she could hear him. And she goes, why do you take that from your father? They were divorced at this time. I said, because the Bible tells me, honor your father and mother. So I'm hoping, Mom. No, I'm angry at him. Don't get me wrong. I'm not like Mr. Sane here. I'm hurt, and I'm angry, and I'm frustrated. But I'm hoping someday that my kids won't ever treat me that way. That's keeping my fingers crossed, right? So far, so good. So far, so good. But what? I'm going to act like Christ. I'm, gonna try, I'm not going to do it all the time. I'm going to fail a lot of times. But that's my aim, to glorify God and to permeate and let everything be permeated with love. Now, let's take a little bit of love and put it into that loaf. Let's take a little bit of love and put it into that yeast. What's the potential? That then everything we do is done in love. Every action we have is done in love. Every word we speak is spoken in love. Every thought that we think is thought in love. And I don't want you guys to act like this is some kind of elementary thing. It's not. This is the goal of the Christian faith. Love God and love your neighbor. That's the goal of the Christian faith. Some of us rather dwell in self-righteousness, and we, we get so comfortable in our knowledge, in our knowledge of theology, in our knowledge of the confessions, in our knowledge of tradition. 
I, I want to be loved by God, and I want to love others. Because I'm tired of being angry. It's exhausting. I'm tired of always being hurt. It's exhausting. But I cannot ignore areas of my life that I know that are not pleasing to God. I cannot ignore when I hurt somebody, I can't ignore that and act like it didn't happen. I can't. I have to take responsibility for what I've done. And that's happened a lot in my life. I've done so many dumb things, and I get confronted. And this, oh, if, if, you're, if you're an employee and not a boss, the next time your boss comes to you and says, did you really do that? Don't make an excuse. Say, yeah, I did. That was me, man. I don't know what I was thinking. They don't know what to say. I've done it so many times. They're like, what? You, you did that? I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Please forgive me. I promise I'll do my best not to do it again. And they're like, oh, okay. Well, good for you. All right, well, next time, just think about it twice. But if I deny that, they just, they, they want that. That's like, that's the, they smell blood, right? But man, when you take, I tell my son this all the time, you take responsibility for what you did. Man up, son. But dad, I'm gonna get in trouble. Oh yeah, you are. But there's no guilt. There's nothing hidden anymore. There's no lying. There's no lying anymore. There's nothing you're, you're running from. It's already exposed. As C.S. Lewis says, drink the shame. It burns as it goes down, but once it goes down, it won't come back up. Drink it. This young man had to drink his shame. Why? That he might be restored. I don't want to live my life in malice and evil. I want to live my life in sincerity and truth. John says this about Jesus. He came full of grace and truth. I live in the reality of God's light. It exposes me. It exposes my sin. It exposes my shortcomings. I don't make excuses. I say, yes, Lord, please forgive me. Help me to repent. Help me to turn away. If you look back in our stained glass, I love sitting up here because I always see it. Three things of Christ. Christ knocking at the door, Christ the good shepherd, and Christ showing us the scars on his hands that he's paid for it. But he's knocking on the door, not of the unbeliever, but of the believer's heart, right? Revelation. It's to the believer. Because sometimes, you guys, we come to church every Sunday and we become more political than we do spiritual. We're more political than we are spiritual. That's not why Christ died for you. He didn't. He didn't die to make us politicians. He died to make us children, brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul says, hey guys, therefore let us celebrate the festival. Let us celebrate. I, I, I love when we come to church and you feel the joy in the room. Don't you love that? You feel the expectations. We're coming to God's house. I have a friend of mine, every Sunday at their church, they, before the confession, <clears throat> they confess their sins privately to the Lord. Then the pastor goes up and he shares the gospel and he reminds the audience, you are now forgiven. Christ has died for those sins. My friend goes, I go to, every, I go to church every Sunday to hear those words. He's my best friend, so I know what a mess he is, all right? He needs to hear those words. I guess in closing, I just have one question for us. Are you living your life in sincerity and truth? Sincerity. I want the best for Julio. I want the best for his marriage. I want the best for this church. I want the best for Steve. I want the best for Cindy. I want the best for my children. I want to do it in sincerity, not double-faced. In sincerity. If I'm in sin, if I've hurt you, please come and tell me. I really didn't mean it. I am kind of ignorant. Ask my wife. I say things and do things without even knowing. If I walked away from you in the middle of a conversation, it's because I have ADD. I just, I just like, bird, you know, squirrel. Oh, you know, I could talk to somebody. I had a girl in my youth group. She thought I didn't like her. I'd be talking to her, and every time someone else come up, I'd be like, oh, hey. And she goes, I thought for years you just didn't like me. I felt so bad. I said, no, baby, I, I love you. I just have a short attention span, like a two-year-old sometimes. Please forgive me. 
Sincerity and truth. I'm not going to deny it. I'm going to be sincere about it. I'm going to hope the best. I'm going to love the best. The goal of this discipline in this church was to restore this young man, not to ostracize him. It wasn't to win. It wasn't to win and be right. It was to restore and be humble. Let's pray and take our positions to the Lord.